Hi, everybody. I am John T. Kelt. I was fortunate to grow up farming in New Zealand. Uh, here is me 40 years ago, first day of school, near where Sir Howard Morrison grew up in the Urawera Ranges. And this is my beloved family, my mum and dad, a photo from the 80s. You can probably all recognize similar photos from your album. And this is me as a young guy. I thought I was going to be either a possum trapper or a fly fishing guide when I grew up. And I mention this because if you look at my journey from there, which I'm going to talk a little bit about, it may seem a little haphazard and risky, but it's because of where and who I came from that I was kind of easily able to do it, or it didn't seem like a big risk at the time every step I took. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that journey and some of the things I'm thinking about today and, and where we're going. Um, so I started in banking after my fun time in university in Otago. It seemed like the safe option. If there are any students in the room, I had no clue what I was going to do with my life. I didn't know what I was good at, other than I wanted to kind of be self-sufficient and have fun and learn and challenge myself. So, you know. That was the kind of way to go about that, at least to get started. But I quickly understood that the internet was new green fields, much more interesting and exciting than the, the banking world, as, as important of an institution that is in our society. And so I started a tech company in the UK in the dot-com boom in the late 90s, as you could back then with no experience. And since then, I've been in tech for about 20 years. Um, been involved with five startups, three as co-founder, two as uh, incoming CEO. Um, and some of those have been in digital media, e-commerce, uh, mobile publishing, and data and analytics. So each of those were kind of at the bleeding edge at different points of time, whether it be the late 90s, the mid-2000s, and so on. Um, and I've kind of seen the evolution of, of the tech industry firsthand. It's been a fantastic journey. I feel very fortunate to have been part of that. Um, today, I work at Palantir Technologies, which, as Jeff alluded to, the heart and soul of that company is catching bad guys, keeping the West safe. We partner with a lot of Western governments, intelligence services, military, uh, border control, and others, including the New Zealand government, to help catch those bad people trying to do bad things. That's kind of the heart and soul of Palantir, but I work in the commercial business, helping lead that. Um, we have defensive use cases in the financial sector, helping catch fraudsters and insider traders and cyber criminals. But we also help companies grow and survive, mainly large uh, existing organizations. So that's been my kind of my day job journey to date. Um, along the way, I've been acquired five times in this crazy tech world. Companies get eaten up here, left, right, and center. And I've done a bunch of acquisitions myself. So merging and evolving these organizations has been a big part of it. Um, for about 10 years, I've been investing out of my own uh, investment fund called Fantel Ventures. And that has been a journey of, of trial and error, of entrepreneurship. But I'm not the guy with the to-do list. I'm investing in founders that have a vision, are athletes, and are willing to you know, be creative and get ready for the challenges that will come. That's the first way I assess these, these early stage uh, businesses. And then the second is, how big is this problem, and, and why does it matter? Um, because if, if that's not you know, important, then clearly we've got a problem. Um, but more recently, you know, my, my, my view of these things has increased to the point where I'm looking at, and how is this good for society? Um, so just going around the clock there, you can see marketing technology and e-commerce and you know, fintech um, data. I mean, recently I've been much more interested in nutrition and health. I think the world is changing very quickly there as big food gets found out and consumer preferences are changing and people are realizing things like uh, how animal protein is 20 to 40 times more impactful on the environment than growing a, the same unit of plant-based protein. Um, and so there's a big change afoot, both in the tech world, but also in nutrition. And these are the kind of areas that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of excited about at the moment. But um, if you look at my journey, both as a day job and then my other day job doing kind of investments, um, 
you know, I've been living and breathing early stage tech and just building companies, you know, the teams, the strategies, the economics of them, and, and how we're going to respond to changing environments for you know, about 20 years. And, and it's, it doesn't get old. It's, it's fantastic. Um, I've, I've had some, some zeros, as we call them. Uh, as a founder, I've, I've had to close down a company and report back to investors that we, we made a complete zero. Very painful experience. Um, and as an investor, I've done that a couple of times. Well, it's my own money, so it's less painful than telling someone else that. But, um, you know, so, so there's been some traumatic times along the journey, which you could all imagine is kind of part of the landscape. Um, but I've also been fortunate to be part of some successes. Um, what is success? I mean, the Gordy metric that often gets reported about, because the media is fa fascinated with numbers, is, is money, right? Um, as an investor and as an executive, I've been involved with billion dollar exits, but it's more about the, the team and the, 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 the fortitude and the figuring out, that's our friend there tapping, uh, the figuring out uh, when the challenges come, how we're gonna deal with them, and then actually, and then actually delivering on that. So, you know, that for me has been the most gratifying thing, as well as actually seeing what success looks like. What does good look like? And one of the things I've learned is that, you know, if capital and ideas are required to get a company going, they're actually the easy part. The hard part is the execution. I mean, these are generalizations, but I would say 75% of the equation is the teamwork and the pivoting and the fortitude and the operational excellence that's going to actually enable you to, to deliver on that original idea that someone funded. Um, and then if you happen to be successful, the success, one must remember, is partly about your great talent and your hard work, but also about a bit of luck. Luck comes along in good ways, and luck comes along in bad ways. And I've learned to be humble about that. A little success doesn't necessarily guarantee future success. Your financial advisor will tell you that as well, probably. Um, so yeah, there, there's a few thoughts on kind of my journey and what I've learned. I put this up here because, to, in my mind, it's my ultimate startup. And I put it, this is Mary Helen, Jack, and Phoebe in New York City eating a bit of pizza. Um, I put it there because, for me, it's not about being the biggest or some other you know, superlative. It's about balance and having a good chunk of family, business, personal, and ultimately more impact and helping the community. And that, for me, is, is the definition of success. So what am I thinking about at the moment? Um, if I put aside the, the chaotic and dangerous geopolitical situation, and I just talk about a little bit of the socioeconomic issues we have out there. I, I, it really worries and concerns me, tech's role in the, in the bifurcation of income, the, the, the haves and the have-nots. Um, tech is, is part of the problem there as, as, they, as individual corporations claim the global market where previously hundreds of companies in local areas would have a little slice of that pie. And also the artificial intelligence we hear about, automating jobs, um, how we're going to deal with these work, this workforce that's getting left behind. I mean, tech is part of the problem. I also think tech will be part of the solution. Um, so, you know, those are some, some of the issues that I think the technology industry is grappling with and certainly I think about. Uh, speaking of AI, um, you know, everyone's worried about when that's going to, you know, start making decisions, the singularity. It's going to actually start to be better, smarter, quicker, and control the world. Um, Elon Musk's most recent startup, one of his, I think his fifth at the moment, is the Neural Lace. I think this is just interesting. He wants to plug the, the human brain into the internet. The I.O. interface between the human brain and the internet is a bit slow, thumbs, eyes, and ears. So let's plug the brain in. And why? Because we need to keep up with the AI. Now, I don't know whether this is all real, but Elon's probably going to know a lot more about it than I am. Um, but it's pretty amazing that someone's even thinking of that at the moment. Um, but in terms of two topics, which I think are really exciting and really impactful, um, I want to tell, talk a little bit about those. One is blockchain. Everyone's heard about it. It's, it's a tough concept to get your arms around. But I, I actually believe it's, it's kind of as big as what the internet was in the 90s. 
we're right at the cusp of technologies maturing to the extent that the promise of, of the blockchain is going to come to be a reality. What is the blockchain? Um, in a sentence or two, just to give the concept, you should all do your reading on this because it is coming and it's important. Imagine a copy of, a, of record of transactions or contracts or even voting that was not controlled by any government or corporation which sat distributed out on the internet on people's computers, protected by cryptography and clever code. These are pretty hard concepts to get your head around, but imagine that. It's not controlled by any corporation or government. The implications of that for our privacy, in a good way, our security, and to fix a lot of problems in the world are very strong. For example, on the voting idea, we know voter turnout is not good. Um, that could be fixed by partnering blockchain with a good mobile application and letting people vote more easily. But the two pictures here I want to show you, just as, as little applications of this, which I think have, have very significant impact for society, and in particular in this case, the unbanked. There's two billion people in the world that don't have a bank account or a financial relationship. The guys on the left here, Bangladeshi workers, they left their families to go and provide for them, uh, working in the Middle East. Slave labor, maybe not, but they certainly work very hard for a pittance. And when they turn up to send money home, the financial intermediary takes about 10% of that. What a tragedy. Blockchain partnered with a mobile application in the next couple of years, I think, will solve that. The guy on the right, he's a very proud owner of a beautiful bull. That bull is the store of value that he has at his disposal. He does not have a bank account. And it's hard for him to evolve in the, in the modern world, let alone you know, the risk that that entails if his bull catches a cold. So blockchain, I encourage you to work, read about it, learn about it. Um, the second thing is nutrition. As I mentioned, um, I guess it's a visceral reaction to me learning about what you put into your body and how that makes you feel and the health benefits of it as, as one ages. I guess that's, the, the, that's been the starting point of it for me. But then learning about the impact of animal protein on the environment. Um, obviously, these are, these are topics which, which are, are evolving quite quickly. And for me, this has been quite a journey. This is a company that I'm involved with in New York City, Time. They deliver great nutritious meals. They're not salads. They, they have 600 calories of, uh, of nutrition there made up of legumes and, and, and wild rices and other things. And, and this jar will be $1 off when you return it because it's, it's going to be reused 10 times. So there's a real story there. It's all locally produced, and it's good for you. So you know, millennials are loving this stuff, and so are the Gen Zs. And there's a real movement happening here. And so you know, the next little point I want to make here is, is a company called Square Roots. So if, if the porn industry and innovation within the porn industry gave us Netflix, the innovation within the cannabis industry has given us hydroponically locally grown vegetables, GMO-free, pesticide-free, and in this case, Square Roots has a system for growing vegetables in shipping containers in dilapidated inner city areas and training out-of-work local disenfranchised people to become farmers. This particular photo is in Jay-Z's tenement parking lot where he used to sell crack cocaine in Brooklyn. And they've got 20 farms here. And each of the farmers are local folks that were otherwise out of work. Max there, you can see, he is delivering me my weekly uh, party pack, he calls it, which is an incredible, tasty, uh, tasty vegetable experience. So you know, that, that's, a, that's one, a, one example of a triple benefit. There are profits to be made, we hope, in this business as we figure out and scale. Uh, but it's also impacting the community, and it's, it's helping the environment. The footprint of traveling this vegetables is, is much smaller, of course. So what about the road ahead? I would say it is going to be more chaotic, crazy, and possibly unsafe which is a little concerning. But in context of all of that, I think the opportunities for New Zealand are accentuated. And that is because not only are we a beacon for our physical attributes, a place to visit, a place to buy produce from, a place to invest increasingly, 
but also because of the stability of our political, economic, and mental state, we are a beacon to an increasingly dumbified world. Social media has blame for that, various other factors, but I think the, the Kiwi state of mind, the fair-minded, good judgment, is going to be increasingly sought out, both in government context and also in commercial context. So it's a very, it's a very exciting and optimistic thought I have about this. And you know, just one example of this which is both a technological marvel, but also an example of this, this Kiwi state of mind, is of course this. And you know, we're not there yet, but heck, what an example to the rest of the world, you know, against all odds. And so, fingers crossed, we're gonna get there. You know, broken chip teeth and sprained thumbs, we'll, we'll make it. But it's, it, it's exactly the point I'm, I'm kind of making here. So, Thanks for listening. <laughs>